Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Inhaled Insulin. Fast in, fast out, fits your lifestyle. By Omnipod. Simplify life with Omnipod 5. And by Dexcom G7. Powerful, simple diabetes management. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, long thought impossible, people with type 1 diabetes are now working as commercial airline pilots. The very first to be certified in the U.S., Pietro Marsala, says he decided to forge ahead while working as a flight instructor, taking inexperienced student pilots up while he was in control. When we first start flying, we don't know how to fly. We go to school to learn to fly because we don't know how to fly, right? Here I am teaching these students how to fly airplanes, and yet I'm the one responsible. And so that's kind of what led me to thinking to myself, like, wait, something isn't right here. Pietro will share what happened next, how a mountain of data gradually won over skeptics, his in-flight diabetes routine, and what he's up to now. You might be a passenger on his next flight. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your health care provider. Welcome to another week of the show. I am your host, Stacey Sims. You know we aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. And boy, have I wanted to talk to Pietro Marsala for a long time. As you'll hear, he got his commercial pilot license here in the U.S., In 2020, it was just before the pandemic, so he was grounded, like everybody else, for quite a while. And we've had to reschedule. I think the last time he had lost his voice, but I am actually really glad we waited because two things have happened in the last couple of weeks that are just fantastic. Dexcom gave him a big honor, and that's no wonder because CGM is an integral part of his story, as you'll hear. It is really hard to see a world where the FAA clears a person who uses insulin without CGM data, and he just got his dream job with American Airlines. This is such a great story. It was a real honor to talk to a true diabetes pioneer. You'll hear that in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Omnipod. And it used to be that you would have to choose between an automated insulin delivery device and the freedom of a tubeless device. Now with Omnipod 5, you can have the best of both worlds all in one. Omnipod 5 adapts with every pod change to meet your unique insulin needs and adjusts insulin using a customized target glucose, not a range. If you're ready to ditch the multiple daily injections or send your tubed pump packing, there's never been a better time. They'll even check your insurance coverage for you. Fill out the quick online form, see if you're eligible for a free trial at omnipod.com slash diabetes connections. You can also go to our homepage and click on the Omnipod logo For full safety, risk information, and free trial terms and conditions, also visit Omnipod.com slash Diabetes Connections. Pietro, thank you so much for joining me. I am so excited to talk to you. Thanks for sharing your story with me and my listeners. Thank you so much for having me, Stacey. It's an honor to be here. Oh, thank you. Let me start by asking you, are you flying today? Are you going anywhere exciting? Oh no, I'm off. I'm actually it's kind of funny. I've been off since uh, March 31st. I've been uh, been displaced off a couple of trips, which means that they're using uh, my position for somebody else, and they're paying me to stay home. So it's been nice. I can't complain. Oh, Not going back till Monday. Interesting. But let me start by asking you, what made you interested in doing this? You should know this comes from someone who I fly a lot, but I am a very nervous flyer. I assume you were never a nervous flyer. No, it never it never scared me, honestly. You know, it's funny. I'll just start by saying this. I have a fear of heights, and there's a lot of pilots. There are, there are a lot of pilots that do. Standing on a tall balcony or, uh, you know, on the edge of a building, I don't, I don't do well there. But being in an airplane, I've always, I've always felt secure. It's never, never scared me to be on an airplane. <laughs> That's funny. Did you always want to fly, though? Yeah. When, you know, is this something from a little kid? Yeah, absolutely. So I started, I mean, my, my, my love for aviation started at a young age. Uh, my parents are Italian immigrants, and so we used to travel back and forth to Italy in the summers. Uh, to visit their family, uh, well, our family, I should say. Obviously, getting on a plane is necessary to go across the Atlantic, and so every summer that was what I looked forward to, not just the vacation, but the actual flying experience to get there is always something that I uh, I always looked up at the sky wanting to do this, so it was, 
it was definitely something I was interested in from a young age. I was a kid that had to sit at the window and, you know, I had to go up to the cockpit and, you know, pre nine eleven, you can actually, you can actually go in there during the flight. Now, wow. obviously things have changed uh, post nine eleven, but wow. uh, prior to nine eleven, I just remember, you know, going in there with my dad and he would bribe me and say, look, you're going to have to be a good kid if, you know, for the next couple of weeks before we leave, if you want to go in there and meet the pilots and whatnot. And so of course I was on my best behavior for two weeks and they'd bring me up there. And we would, uh, you know, we would we'd meet the pilots in flight. And it was just, I mean, I remember seeing just all the buttons and all the lights and just being so intrigued by the whole thing. Yeah, that's amazing. You became a private pilot in that you got your certification right when you were a young adult. And then that's when it seems like everything changed. And you were initially misdiagnosed. Can you tell me a little bit about like that, that time in your life? Yeah, absolutely. So I was 21 years old. Uh, it was January of 2012. And uh, I started feeling off. Uh, I was in the middle of my flight training. I was uh, training to be a commercial pilot. And when I say commercial pilot, that means that I was training to get my commercial certificate, which just a commercial pilot certificate just allows you to be paid to fly like a commercial driver. And so I was studying and doing my training for that, getting my ratings towards becoming an airline pilot. When in January 2012, I started feeling a little off uh, the classic symptoms of diabetes, right? So I was uh, had really dry mouth, I, I frequently urinating waking up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom and lost about 10 pounds in a week and all the classic symptoms that we all know about with, with diabetes. But of course, I didn't know anything then. And so I went to a family physician. My mom says, hey, let's let's go check this out. This doesn't sound right. So we moved to a family physician. He says, uh, he looks at me and says, well, these are, these are the symptoms of diabetes. And I'm thinking to myself, diabetes, you're kidding. I'm 21 years old. I thought diabetes happened to people that in their old age that didn't take care of themselves. I had no idea that there were even two types, really. And so he looks at me, he ran, he ran some blood work, and yeah, he, he diagnosed me with actually type 2 diabetes in January of 2012. And that was enough to pull your, what's called, I guess, a medical certification. That was enough to just pull you from being a pilot at the time? That's correct, yeah. So the Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA, at that time in 2012, viewed insulin as a disqualifying drug and to carry what's called a first-class medical certificate. Mm. And so for those that are listening that aren't familiar, as pilots, we carry both pilot certificates and medical certificates. And basically, those medical certificates uh, determine uh, what privileges we can exercise as airmen, right, as, as pilots. In the United States, in order to be an airline pilot, you need to uh, have a airline transport pilot certificate along with a first-class medical certificate, which, uh, again, was on insulin. You were never able to hold that, again, because insulin being the disqualifying factor there. But you didn't even have type 2. I'm always amazed that people survive these kinds of misdiagnoses. How long did it take before you got the right diagnosis? Yeah, so I'll just start by saying that, obviously, you know, the type 2 diagnosis was crushing, but I had hope because I knew that on type 2 or with type 2, that that was the quote unquote good kind, uh, the way I was looking at it, because I was able to still pursue my dream of becoming an airline pilot if I was able to stay off insulin. And what the doctor had told me at the time was that if you can manage on diet and exercise and take oral medication, uh, you'll be just fine. And so I did my homework when I got home that day and figured out that if I can stay off the insulin uh, and lean off the insulin and manage on diet and exercise and oral medication, that I'd be able to get my medical certificate back and I can resume my career as an airline pilot. So while I was crushed, Obviously, you know, being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at 21 years old, I knew that there was still hope for me to pursue my career. Six months later, here I am. I think it was two months in, I leaned off the insulin. So January 2012, they started me on insulin to get my, my A1C down. And two months into that, we leaned off the insulin because I was managing on diet and exercise. And at the time, I'd, I'd been taking metformin to manage my type 2 diabetes. And then about eight months after the initial, maybe maybe nine months actually after the initial diagnosis, I started feeling a little off again. I'm thinking to myself, what's going on? And I, I started, you know, was testing my blood sugar with a, you know, glucometer and I was recognizing that my, my blood sugar was higher and higher every morning. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, how is that possible? I had an eight since seven o'clock last night. And so my mom says, you know what, let's get a second opinion. I don't like what's going on here. And so we do that. And so we go see an endocrinologist and uh, he looks at me and says, well, you don't fit the bill of a type two diabetic. And I'm thinking to myself, what are you talking about? And he said, well, did they run this test on you? And it was like, I forget if it's a C-peptide or, or what, what test it is that they determine basically, you know, which type sure. of diabetic you are. And he looks at me and says, well, you don't fit the bill of a type 2 diabetic. First of all, you're young and you're lean. And he goes, this is typically what we see with type 1 diabetics. And I, immediately I interrupted him probably rudely and said, whoa, 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 I can't be type 1 diabetic. I know that that requires insulin and I'm a student pilot, you know, training to be a commercial pilot. And that's not possible for me. And he says, well, let's, and he, he responded correctly and said, well, let's not worry about your career right now. Let's worry about your health. Obviously, as a 21-year-old kid, that's not something 
that you want to hear when you're, you know, you have a dream. So he, he was obviously right. And, uh, he ran a test and called me back in the office and confirmed it was type one diabetes, which to this day, it was the most crushing day of my life. As many of you can relate. I can't even imagine. Do you remember what you did? Because it's easy for me to imagine that you went home and said, well, I'm going to fight this because we know how your story ends. But I imagine that on that day or maybe for a while after, it was crushing. Obviously, initially I was crushed. Uh, I went back home and, and thought that was it. That was the end of my flying career. And I didn't know what to do. I mean, I felt so guilty. My parents were paying for my school and oh, wow. my parents are hardworking, middle class people. They didn't have, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars just laying around to put me through school. This was a commitment that I had to pursue my goal in my career. And it was a big sacrifice that my parents had to make. So I'm, you know, three quarters of the way done with my flight training, which cost upwards of a hundred grand. And I just felt this burden and, and felt this pressure and this weight on my shoulders because not only now, you know, all that money that they had invested is going to go to waste, but I'm stuck with a disease that I had no control over. And so obviously that was a lot to take in as a 21 year old kid. Um, not that my parents made me feel guilty about it. To circle back to your question. Yeah, it was crushed initially. I, and it, it took me a while to get back on my feet. You know, it, it, I knew that I can hold what was called a third class medical certificate. What that uh, allows me to do is exercise my privileges as a private pilot, or there's very few things that you can do with a third class medical certificate. And one of those things is become a flight instructor. So in other words, you can teach people to fly, but you couldn't fly in an airline setting um, because you would require a first class medical certificate, which again was disqualified because of the insulin. Six months in, you know, I'm at home, I'm trying to learn the insulin again. I'm, you know, I'm not working. I'm at home with my parents. You know, I'm, I'm living at home, like I said, and, uh, you know, I'm exercising a lot. I'm trying to figure this insulin game out. And, and they, they look at me and say about six months in, okay, so, hey, what do you want to do with your life since you can't, you know, pursue your dream as an airline pilot? And I had determined at that point that, you know what, if I can't pursue my dream as an airline pilot, I'm going to help others live theirs was my goal. And I knew that, yeah, it wasn't really what I wanted to do. But at least I can help others live their dream and I'll become a flight instructor as originally planned to build my flight experience to go to the airline. But I'll become a flight instructor and I'll teach people to fly and I'll make a living doing that. That's the next best thing is the way I looked at it, at least. I have a really dumb question. When you're talking about being <laughs> a flight instructor, <laughs> well, yeah, stick around. When, um, when you're talking about <laughs> being a flight instructor, you are getting in a plane, though, right? You are flying you're not instructing from a classroom or from the ground. You're still a person with diabetes, with type 1 who uses insulin, who's getting in a plane and flying, right? That's correct, yeah. So as a flight instructor, um, we did do uh, classroom work as well, but the majority of our time was spent airborne with a student pilot who, let's be real, when we first start flying, we don't know how to fly. We go to school to learn to fly because we don't know how to fly, right? Here I am teaching these students how to fly airplanes. And yet I'm the one responsible. And so that's kind of what led me to thinking to myself, like, wait, something isn't right here. Something's a little off. Like, why am I allowed to train? Right, right. Why does the FAA seem to think it's okay for you to fly with someone else who doesn't know how to fly, but won't let you fly with somebody else? I assume a co-pilot or somebody else who's who's trained as much as you are. It just seems so it, it, it didn't make any sense. right back to PHR answering my question. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Afrezza. And one of the most frustrating parts of mealtime insulin can be the need to pre-bolus. I've seen my son forget to do it or hesitate because he's not confident about mealtiming in a restaurant, you know, when he's out. Afrezza is unique because it is the only ultra rapid acting inhaled insulin available. Once you breathe Afrezza into your lungs using the inhaler, insulin appears in your bloodstream in less than one minute and it may start reducing blood sugar in about 12 minutes. Afrezza allows you to inhale your insulin right when food arrives, even unexpectedly, so you can be spontaneous but still in control without the need for injections at mealtime. Find out more and see if Afrezza is right for you. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Afrezza logo. Afrezza can cause serious side effects, including sudden lung problems and low potassium, and is not for patients with chronic lung disease such as asthma or COPD, or for patients allergic to insulin. Tell your doctor if you ever smoked, have ever had kidney or liver problems, a history of lung cancer, or if you are pregnant or breastfeeding. Most common side effects are low blood sugar, cough, and sore throat. Severe low blood sugar can be fatal. Do not replace long-acting insulin with Afrezza. Afrezza is not for use to treat diabetic ketoacidosis. Please see full prescribing information, including boxed warning, medication guide, and instructions for use on afrezza.com slash safety. Now, back to Pietro talking about what seems like a big lack of logic by the FAA. Right. 
Right, exactly. And that was the head scratcher I had. And so that's what kind of uh, intrigued me to look into the whole thing and, and think, you know, and, and, and research. And so I started researching if there had been any commercial pilots out there with type 1 diabetes. And it kind of led me to Canada and the UK that had they had some approved. And mind you, this is like now 2000 and about 15, 2016. I became a flight instructor in 2014. Okay. Uh, and, and about two years in, it, it dawned on me this whole thing of why they will let me do this, but not that essentially. And so I did my homework and figured out that there had been nobody approved in the United States on insulin. And I thought to myself, well, how is that possible? There's got to be somebody controlled enough to be able to do this professionally in an airline setting with another professional. Like there's no way that every single diabetic out there is uncontrolled and can't do this. I know that I do this two to four flights a day, five to seven hours in an airplane every single day. And I manage myself using a continuous glucose monitor. I knew that this continuous glucose monitor was a game changer. Nobody had been approved. And I knew that I use this. Now, mind you, I was using it for my own health, but then it dawned on me that using this technology can really change things because not only can we keep ourselves safe, but now you can track it and see who's controlled because the, the previously the, the treatment that was needed while in flight while I was instructing was just finger sticks. But I, again, I was going a step further and using a continuous glucose monitor to keep myself safe. And that's kind of where it all clicked for me. And I was like, wow, this could be a game changer if I can show the FAA that this is what I do to keep myself safe for thousands of hours of flight time and never having any episodes of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. And I always keep myself in a safe, healthy range flying with somebody who doesn't know how to fly. So, you know, obviously doing my research for this episode, I read a lot about you and uh, everybody says pretty much that you compiled massive amounts of spreadsheets, that this was an Excel yeah. data dump that you gave to the FAA. <laughs> were you were you comfortable with sharing all of that information? I, I mean, I guess this is something you thought you really have to do. Yeah, I, Stacey, I had nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. I was a flight instructor and I was happy doing it, truthfully. But I knew that this wasn't my ultimate goal. I knew that I wanted to be an airline pilot. And truthfully, all my chips were in. At this point, I figured that, you know, if they were to see that I, they didn't like what they were seeing on my continuous glucose monitoring, print out my clarity reports and my Dexcom uh, that I was printing out, that they that there was a risk that they potentially, because I was volunteering this information, mind you, this was not required. They technically could have said, we don't like what we're seeing. and We're pulling your, your current medical certificate. You're mm -hmm. no longer allowed to instruct. But I knew I was safe enough to do this. I knew that I was keeping myself safe and healthy. And I knew that not just because of my own understanding of diabetes at the time, but also my endocrinologist was backing me. Um, and the FAA was, you know, continuing to certify me. Uh, to flight instruct. And I knew I was safe enough to do this. It was just a matter of showing them that I was safe enough to do it in, a, in, a, in an airline setting. That's great. All right. So tell me about the doctor. Tell me about when the things started to kind of turn around. Yeah. So it was 2016 and uh, June of 2016. And I knew eventually I wanted to show the FAA my data and somehow get to them, but I didn't know. I mean, this is the Federal Aviation Administration. It's not just easy to walk in the front door and say, hi, I'd like to talk to you. You know, there's different branches. There's Oklahoma City, uh, which is a branch, but there's the main aerospace medicine in Washington, D.C. And I find myself there with an ex-girlfriend at the time. And again, again, it's June 2016. It's uh, two years into me flight instructing, four years from diagnosis of type 1. And I'm just touring the museums with her in shorts and a T-shirt. And I come across the FA's building, and she looks at me and says, well, why don't you go in there and talk to them? And I said, you're kidding. I mean, shorts and a T-shirt, I don't. they're not going to take me seriously. I, I'm not quite ready for it. She goes, just go in there and see what they say. So she dared me pretty much to go in there. And so I did. I walk in and there's like a TSA screening kind of thing on the uh, on the right side when you walk in this building. And there's a Department of Transportation on one side and the Federal Aviation Administration on the other, very government-esque building. I walk in and I look at the guard and I say, hi, is Dr. Duvall here, who's the deputy air surgeon for the FA in Washington, D.C.? And so um, he looks at me and he says, who? And I said, again, the, the, the Federal Aviation Administration, the aerospace medicine, he's the deputy air surgeon. And he goes, this is a big building. You're going to need an appointment to go anywhere. And I said, okay, thank you uh, for your time. So I walk out and she looks at me and says, well, how'd it go? This is obviously not great. I mean, I'm here a few minutes later. I said, you know what? I'm just going to fire off an email to him. Very basic to the point, uh, the end of a business day email, right? We never want to open this long email at the end of a work day. So <laughs> right. <laughs> we, all can, we all can relate to that. So I just fire off a very simple email and say, hey, uh, hi, Dr. Balls. This is Jeff Marstall. I'm out of Phoenix, Arizona. I'm, I'm here until Thursday or whatever it was. I'd like to meet with you uh, regarding my third class medical certificate. I'm a type one diabetic. And that was kind of how I left it. And so two hours later, I find myself at dinner with her. And sure as heck, I get an email back from him two hours later at dinner that's saying, hi, Petra, why don't you come, to come by tomorrow at 12? I'd, lo I'd love to meet you. I could not believe my luck. Wow. Yeah, I just was like, you got to be kidding. This is amazing. I can't believe he even got back to me. 
when you met, did he think there was really a possibility or was it was it just curiosity on his part? Yeah. So we met the next day. You know, I didn't know what to expect going into that meeting. So we sit down at this table and he, he looks at me and he says, you know, so you've been diabetic since, you know, 2012. And so we start talking about, I, I started asking him some head scratchers, like, you know, why is that that I'm able to do this and not able to do that? And, you know, he, he gave me some some answers and he kind of shut me down on a couple of things. And I, I kind of figured he would. But I went a step further and said, hey, look, you know, I, I brought this the Dexcom Clarity data with me. Can you take a look at this? And so he said, sure. So I, I was showing him this data. And mind you, these are surgeons in, in aerospace medicine at the Federal Aviation Administration. They oversee aerospace medicine in general. They may not be specialists in diabetes necessarily like an endocr- endocrinologist. Their their knowledge of the latest and greatest diabetes tech may not be what an endocrinologist has. And so I was showing him this data and this, this technology and showing him how it has alerts and alarms and how it allows me to predict and be proactive in my management and how I use this tool to flight instruct every day, multiple times per day, multiple hours per day. Uh, and I never have any episodes. And here is the data to prove that. And I can tell I had his interest because we were there two hours when he started with, we, I don't have too much time for you. <laughs> so uh, I knew I, sp- I knew I'd sparked his interest and it was a great conversation that he and I had. And so, uh, yeah, I was basically showing him how I use this technology to keep myself safe. And we ended the conversation after two hours with, you know, I think you're onto something here. He said, because to my knowledge, you fly more on insulin than anybody in this country. And I said, really? He says, yeah, because most people that get diagnosed with diabetes and, and have to use insulin, they usually stop their flying careers if they're, you know, if they're an airline pilot or uh, if they're, you know, they're flying around for fun. They, they, they rent an airplane occasionally. They go fly for fun on a third class medical. They don't fly as, as often as you do. And so he goes, this is very interesting. He goes, I'd like to keep in touch with you. I said, great. One thing that I, I left out uh, in the beginning here. What I'd like to say, too, is that this is instrumental, what I'm going to tell you. When I went the next day to meet him, he had actually called me from his desk line. And so I had saved the number. And usually when government officials, they call you, it's usually a restricted or unknown number. Mm. And so I had saved his desk line. And this is how I was able to communicate with him once a month, once every other month for the following three and a half years of my life uh, leading up to the medical certification. And so I would call him, you know, once every other month, once a month, and kind of just poke the bear and be pleasantly aggressive. I like to say, hi, Dr. Ball, this is Pietro Marsal out of Phoenix. Any changes? Do we have anything? And he basically give me, you know, we're close, but we're not there yet. We're close, but we're not there yet, um, is what I would get from him for the next three and a half years. And so, yeah, it was just very casual conversations and I would be flooding his inbox with data. Like you said earlier, I mean, I would be sending in clarity reports. And then I even went a step further and created a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet that showed my in-flight data. And so obviously the clarity reports, uh, for those of you who are familiar with that company, show us and it's 24 seven really picture of where our blood sugars are. And, and it's very user friendly and you don't have to be a doctor and endocrinologist to interpret them. And, but I want to step further and created this Microsoft Excel spreadsheet again voluntarily and was sending that in conjunction with my Dexcom clarity reports. And what this Microsoft Excel spreadsheet showed was prior to takeoff, what my blood sugar was, an hour into flight, two hours into flight, and then prior to landing, what my blood sugar was. And in the notes section, I wrote in, did I take any insulin to keep myself in the safe, healthy range? Did I take any carbohydrates to keep myself in a safe, healthy range? And so they had these Excel spreadsheets in addition to the clarity reports for thousands of hours on flight time for the next three and a half years. And it was just an abundance of data that I was just flooding his inbox with. And we would have conversations, you know, going back and forth for those three and a half years about this data that I was sending into his inbox and his email. Um, and I think that's really what, what got it over the hump, that they were able to see all this data in real time, what was going on and what, what time I actually spent flying airplanes. Tell me about the day that you got the call or the email or the in-person message that you could become and would become a pilot. Yeah, so it wasn't that straightforward, but it was uh, CNN, I think it was, released an article stating that the FAA was now going to allow insulin-treated diabetic pilots to fly commercial jets. And I'll never forget it. I was sitting on this very couch where I'm sitting right now doing this interview. My friend sends it to me, who also is a type 1 diabetic pilot. And I couldn't believe my eyes when I opened it. Because again, I had been hearing that we're getting close, but we're not there yet for three and a half years. And truthfully, you kind of start to lose hope at the end, you know, towards three three years, I was thinking to myself, is this just government talk or is this really going to happen, right? I called the doctor immediately on the phone and he picked up and I said, Dr. Ball, is this true? He says, yes, it is. It'll be in the federal registry as of November 7th of 2019. And I was like, great, what do you need from me? And he says, well, go to an ophthalmologist, get your eyes checked, go to a cardiologist, get an EKG, then go to an endocrinologist, can get another comprehensive blood panel. And I said, okay, whatever. I mean, they had eight years of data on me at this point. I was like, how much more do you need? I'm thinking, but whatever you need, I'm here for you. Let's do it. So he says, you know, get all this data to me, get it to me by the uh, new year. And so I had him. Every, I had everything to him right after, uh, I believe, right after, right before uh, Thanksgiving of 2019. 
Uh, and so he said, send me all this data and uh, we'll go from there. And I said, perfect. Well, now that there was a rule change in place and a protocol in place, because that was what I was really trying to convince them to do is not just, I told them when we were going through those three and a half years of conversations, I said, look, I don't want to just see myself get certified. I, I want to see a change for others to benefit, particularly kids growing up with the same dream that I had as a type one diabetic kid. They can use this as an incentive to take care of their health. I said, I want to see a change in regulation and a change in policy so that others can benefit from this too, because if, it, if this medical is just for me, I don't want it. And he obviously agreed and they couldn't do that. If they certified me, they have to certify everybody else the same way. But I just wanted to make that clear. And we were always on the same page. And so January comes around and uh, no medical and February comes around, still no medical. And now there's rumors of pandemic coming. And I'm thinking to myself, you got to be kidding me. Oh. Finally, this is all happening. And now they're talking about furloughs at airlines, people being laid off, airlines hiring or uh, freezing their hiring. Um, I'm thinking to myself, the government's going to shut down. The FAA is going to lose all my data. I'm going to have to start from scratch. Who knows who's going to retire early? I was afraid that the doctor was going to retire and all this that I had been working with was going to go to waste. And, you know, it was a really stressful time, obviously, for all of us in the, in the beginning of that pandemic. But, you know, for my, my story, it was uh, even more stressful, not just the pandemic coming and people losing their jobs, but I'm thinking to myself, everything that I put in is going to get lost. And so April 13th, actually yesterday, <laughs> was uh, three years yesterday. Ah. Um, I'm driving, yeah, April 13th of 2020. I'm driving around with my girlfriend and my uh, my smartwatch goes off and I'm driving, like I said, and I see this back-to-back emails from the FA. I'm like, holy cow, this could be it. She's like, you're way too excited. You need to pull over. <laughs> and so so I, I did. Obviously, that was a smart choice. Um, so yeah, I pull over to the side of the road and get myself to a safe spot. And I open these emails up and got this like password you got to put in and to get into it. And there was this 12 page letter associated with this document. And I didn't care about any of it, what it said. All I wanted to do was scroll to the bottom of this email and see the certificate with my name on it that said first class medical. And so I do, I open it, I immediately scroll to the bottom, don't read any of it. And what, what, I mean, I'll get there what it said in the beginning, but basically what it, what it was, was a medical certificate, but it was in the beginning of the letter. It said basically how to, you know, continue being certified and how to uh, keep your certification going. But obviously, I didn't care about any of that. I just wanted to see my name on it with the certificate. I open it up and I see that. And to this day, that was definitely the best day of my life. You know, all that work that I'd put in to, you know, getting myself certified and, and I was hoping that others would be as well. And, and just seeing my name on it, it was just, I mean, like I said, I, I, can't, I don't have words to describe how I felt at the moment. I just, I was crying like a little kid. That's awesome. Uh, really. And I just, yeah, I, I, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm super close with my family and I didn't even give them a call. 45 seconds later, I'm on the phone with the doctor in DC. He picks up <laughs> and uh, I'm crying still thanking him uh, for this and, and this opportunity. And he shared with me that, you know, if I didn't shed a tear when I sent this out, I'd be lying to you. Um, I just want you to know because all of this voluntary submission of data that you were able to provide, we were able to create a protocol and show that this is something that was able to be safe, you know, to be done because without this amount of substantial, substantial amount of data, you know, this wouldn't have been able to be proven. And so he said, thank you for all that, you know, that you provided and all that you've done. You, you know, you've changed the lives for many going forward. I just want to congratulate you and you're officially the first insulin treated diabetic pilot that we've certified as the first medical I've sent out. So congratulations to you and all your hard work. And obviously that was not my goal to be the first, but to hear that from top doctors at DC, it was just such an honor and it still is such an honor. Well, and let's underscore that. All the work you did, I mentioned the piles and piles of Excel spreadsheets and all of the other information that you gave them did create this pathway. Do you know how many other people have used that to become pilots with type 1 diabetes since 2020? Yeah, definitely. I don't know the exact number, how many have been certified, but I know there there have been many people that have been certified since my certification, and I keep in touch with many of them as well. I would say by the dozens. um, By the dozens? Maybe, yeah. I would would imagine even more now. That was in 2020. You know, I keep in touch with a lot of people via my social media channel on on Instagram, and I know for a fact I've, I've spoken to at least 20 or so that, that have been certified since. And it's been, it's been awesome to see this change. And there's, you know, there's a, there's a protocol in place now. There's parameter that you have to fall within, which is, in my opinion, very fair. Others are able to benefit from this change. And it's just so satisfying for me to see that. And when mm-hmm. you're flying, that's a physical activity. Do you, can you share a little bit about what happens to your body? You know, does blood sugar, again, does blood sugar go up during takeoff, things like that? No, it, it honestly, it doesn't. There is an adrenaline rush but it's not as, as big as you might think. Mm. I had been used to it as a flight instructor doing it for years. And when you're flying, they teach you to be calm and stay focused. And I know going into it, I have a certain diet that I like to follow um, when I'm on the road. And so I, 
I like to manage with a lower carb diet. Mm -hmm. And so my goal is to, you know, the less insulin I have to take, the less risk there is for hypoglycemia, obviously. And so I like to eat a lower carb, not zero carb, but lower carb diet. Um, and so I like to go into it with a flat, you know, a flat line in, in my flights. And, and to answer your question, I guess, um, no, I don't get into adrenaline rush like that. It spikes my blood sugar from it. I don't, I don't see that. Uh, I mean, I do it so often too. Um, or it's not like, you know, once a year I get to do this. I do this, you know, you're not flying like me, day, four days a week. <laughs> like gripping the armrest. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't affect that me. Would like that would be bad. That would be bad for you. How, how do you treat lows when you're in flight? Uh, and and I, I'm asking that for what you like. I'm always, I'm always nosy, but also what's handy? How do you, where do you keep it in the cockpit? The thing that works best for me is glucose tablets. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I go back to my whole strategy of, you know, the less insulin you have to take, the less. Uh, chance you have of going well. Low snacks, yeah, I have always snacks with me, and I like to keep myself on a higher fat, higher protein diet while I fly too. And so I'm, I'm snacking throughout the course of the flight, but I'm not taking big swings of insulin to avoid those episodes really. And so if need be, I have glucose tablets there if I need them. But I, I obviously, like I said, I, I manage with lower insulin amounts, so I don't I don't need them. Um, but they're there just in case I do need them. And yeah, I just like to go about managing it that way. That you know, if I see it coming, but that's that's the beauty of a CGM, right? Yeah. Um, and that's why I always state that this is game-changing technology because before I get to those points, I'm using this, this this tool to allow myself to not get to that point. So if I see it coming, I can treat it. You know, if I'm 100 one arrow down or 100 uh, with an arrow to 45 on the way down, I can. I like to keep myself between about 100 and about 140, 150 while I fly. That's where I'm comfortable being. That's kind of like the range that I like to be in. And so I'll keep myself there. And if necessary, I'll treat it with you know some cashews, some cheese, some you know, some healthier snacks that I see fit um, for the flight to just keep myself in that range. I'm curious what, uh, I didn't ask you before, do you use an insulin pump? I don't. I, I do MDI. And so that is a question I get a lot. Um, I'm not opposed to an insulin pump. I think they're great, especially the newest ones. I think they're uh, incredible technology now that they're uh, integrated with your continuous glucose monitors. But the reason that I didn't change it, and it, it, it works for me. And so number one, it works for me doing MDIs. Number two, I didn't want to change it during the certification process mm-hmm. because I didn't want to give them a chance to deny me a medical because now I switched my treatment. So that's kind of how I went about it. And so I got comfortable on MDI. And I'm sure one day I'll use a pump. And for those of you listening that are curious if a pump is approved, they absolutely are approved. Um, the ones that are FDA approved that are tied to your insulin pump are, you don't quote me on it, but I believe they are. You can look on the FAA's website if you want to look into that. But pumps are approved um, as well as CGMs that are required. Pumps are not required um, where CGM is to fly in a first-class medical as, as an airline pilot. Does the FAA set A1C or time and range restrictions or requirements for getting your certification? Right back to Pietro explaining what it takes. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom G7. It's here. The all-new Dexcom G7 continuous glucose monitoring system is now available. Powerful and simple, Dexcom G7 is proven to lower A1C and help you spend time in range, all without finger sticks, scanning, or calibrations. There are so many amazing new features to talk about here. You know, Dexcom G7 is 60% smaller than the previous generation. It's the most accurate CGM system out there. The 30-minute warm-up period is fantastic, and it's up to two times faster than any other CGM brand. And I love the all-in-one sensor and transmitter. To learn more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. Now, back to Pietro explaining what the FAA wants to see from candidates with diabetes. Yeah, so now there's a protocol in place and you have to follow these within these parameters. Uh, I could just read them off. So CGM sensor wear at least 90% of time or greater. Um, they want time and range uh, 80 to 180 to be 70% or greater and an overall glucose reading of 70 to 250 to be 90% or greater. And they really what they're looking for here, they want to see you avoid low blood sugar, right? Their concern with this whole thing was low blood sugar, low blood sugar, low blood sugar. And so they want to see you avoid lows. And obviously they understand that as diabetics, you know, it's impossible to never go low, right? But what they do want to see is that if you do get a little low, you treat yourself and you bring it back up and you stay away from the low. They don't want to see you get low and stay low, in other words. It says less than 70%. They want to see you less than 4% of the time and less than 55, 1% of the time. And so one other thing that I'd like to put in here is their coefficient of variation. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, it's found on your um, Dexcom Clarity reports. Um, you can find your coefficient of variation. For those of you that use Dexcom, may be familiar with it. But 
um, basically what this is, is your range, your fluctuation in your blood sugars within a given time. And so they want to see that to be 30, between uh, less than 33%. It says, but we'll consider 33 to 36%. So they don't want to see your bl- blood sugar fluctuate too much. You know, they don't want to see bounced off the walls between 350 and 50 all day long, in other words. You know, it's funny. Reading some of the articles that others, that others have written, there's a great one on Healthline that I'll link up. The author mentions that back in the olden days, <laughs> when women started flying, men walked off the planes. Like the, the men pilots would not fly with the female pilots. Has anybody, which I thought was an interesting thing to stick in his article, right? But it's a really, it makes a really good point that people are always worried about change. Have you ever had any pushback to your co-pilots or anybody who finds out you have type one you know, flying with you? No, in fact, it's been the opposite. I've had a tremendous amount of support from my company, from, you know, my chief pilot's office, from the staff, I mean, from the beginning. And, and the way that air, the company looks at it is they're not medically certified to make these determinations or to make this, this this judgment, right? And so if you're certified medically, then they treat you like anybody else, and rightly so. Um, it's the Federal Aviation Administration's job to certify you medically. It's their job to certify you as a pilot. I've never had any pushback. In fact, you know, when I get in the cockpit and I'm flying with a new captain I haven't flown with, uh, I look over and just tell that captain, hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm a type 1 diabetic. If you see me occasionally, check out uh, my glucose numbers on my, on my phone that's required for my medical. And none of them have ever given, ever given me any pushback. It's part of the game. You know, it just uses Bluetooth like you all know. And this is kind of the way of life. And no, nobody's ever given me any pushback. The passengers don't know I'm a type 1 diabetic. And it's funny, when this first got released, I got I got some heat from, you know, various forums and, uh, you know, just reading various comments. I would say 99% of people have been very supportive uh, and just can't believe this rule has changed and very supportive of me and what I'm doing. Yeah, you know, you get the occasional, I can't believe it, I would never get in an airplane knowing that my pilot is diabetic. And everybody's entitled to their own opinion, and I respect that. But I wouldn't be here if I didn't deserve to be here. I, I can leave it at that. You know, there's people that are much smarter than myself that make these decisions and evaluate my level of risk, and they know that uh, I meet these qualifications. And uh, just looking at these numbers, I know that I exceed them as well. And so I know I'm safe enough to do it. I've done it for eight years on insulin. Well, no, more than that now, actually, as a flight instructor, eight years, and, I'm sorry, seven and a half years and as an airline pilot for the last year and a half. So I know I'm safe enough to do it. You were recently honored by Dexcom. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Did they name a line after you? Tell me about what Dexcom did for you, Pedro. <laughs> yeah, they did. It was such an honor. You know, I know I'm biased here because I work with Dexcom, but they're such a great company. Uh, I have nothing but great things to say about Dexcom and the people that work for that great company. Um, I said it on my social media channels, and I'll say it, you know, forever. I have a partnership with them. And they reached out to me. They heard the story uh, in 2021, this was, where uh, they got a hold of me in their, their Dexcom Warrior program, invited me out to Atlanta to film a commercial for the Dexcom G6 system. And uh, that's kind of how I got connected with Dexcom. And then since then, they've been very supportive of what I've done using their technology. And, you know, and in the speeches that I give, I stress a lot that, you know, this would have would not have been possible without this technology. And so I'm thankful for everything that Dexcom has able to do for not just myself, but so many others, but, you know, particularly for my own story, I was able to use that data to really open doors that at first seemed impossible. So, yeah, so I, I have a partnership with them and they recently, you know, they named the line after me for the Dexcom G7, the vice president of, of Dexcom Global Operations pulled me aside in September when I was speaking to their global team. I was giving a speech in San Diego and he pulls me aside after my speech and says, look, we want to name a manufacturing line, the very first manufacturing line of the Dexcom G7 after you. We want your family to be there and get emotional thinking about it. But, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, it was such an honor. I mean, recently in March, they had myself and my family out there and we were able to, uh, um, all meet, uh, their team and they, they planned this whole event around me. It was just so special. I gave a speech and then they surprised me with this, this line that, that I knew they were naming after me, but they had a picture of me up on their, in their factory and in their distribution center. Wow. And, uh, on the wall, it said, uh, you know, every CGM that goes through these doors will change a life. And, something that I hold very close to my heart. And I, I truly believe that this technology has changed lives for so many people. And I just want to say one thing that I hope my story has inspired others to live out their dreams. You know, whether you, if you're listening to this, whether you want to be a pilot or not, great. But I hope that my story has given you um, some more courage to pursue your dreams and not let type one stop you from living them. Because truthfully, I mean, we really can't do anything. And I, and I really mean that. Yeah. What was it like to walk into that Dexcom factory with your parents, with your face on the wall, being honored? I can't even imagine, Pietro. Oh, man, it was it was one of the better days of my life, for sure, just seeing that 
you know, me out of all people is just it's incredible. I mean, they really appreciated my story and taken to heart what I was able to do. And just seeing that there, uh, my face on that wall with my family there, and it's just it's just come full circle, really. Just I remember just sitting in that doctor's office, crying my eyes out, mm. thinking to myself, my dream is over. And 10 years later, here we are, and they're honoring me and, and, and my family, really, uh, for everything that I've done was just an incredible feeling. That, and then something, I'll, like I said, I'll, I'll hold close to my heart forever. It's just it's unbelievable. Does your mom still worry? What does your mom say about all of this? <laughs> does she worry about what me flying? All of it. Diabetes, flying. All of it. <laughs> I mean, you're a mom, you know. Moms are always going to be moms, right? <laughs> so, you know, she's she's always checking up on me. Where are you at? How you doing? She knows. You know, I've never let her follow my numbers. Yeah. Just because she would see a, a, a 90 and think that, you know, the world is ending. I try to keep her away from that, but she... She knows. She knows I take good care of myself, and she's proud of me, and she knows I'm very independent with my diabetes, and both my parents are really proud of how far I was able to come. She knows there's always the risk, but, you know, she checks on me periodically, and I have to tell her sometimes, Mom, I'm working. All's good. You'll know if something's not good. (laughs) I always say the autobiography of every type 1 kid or adult is, Mom, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I wish I had it on recording where I could just hit play. (laughs) Are you at American now? Did I see that? Yes. My dream and my goal has always been to be an airline pilot, right? But growing up as a kid, our airline of choice is American Airlines. Oh. And so that kind of stayed with me and just the way that, you know, that company operates and the way, you know, that's what I saw as a kid. And so growing up in Chicago, traveling back and forth to Italy, that's who I always wanted to fly for. It was a dream for me to fly for them. And so I started my airline career after they started hiring again in 2021. I, I got hired by American Eagle, um, which for those of you who don't know, it's the regional partner for American Airlines. We fly generally in a certain region of the country. And, uh, and then we progress to American Airlines. Usually, you know, it takes five to seven years to progress to American Airlines from there. But there's been so much movement in the industry. And American Airlines heard my story. They appreciated it. They offered me a chance to interview. And 24 hours later, I was offered a job on February 25th of this year. And so it's been really a dream come true for me. I just I can't believe how far this has all come and their appreciation for the story and, and everything that I've done. And for them to show their support has just been incredible. They've, they've mm-hmm. just, I've had nothing but great support from so many people, and it's just been such an honor. All right. Well, I'm in Charlotte. We're your hub, so I'll okay. be looking for you. <laughs> I was curious if you <laughs> ever, you know, spot kids, you know, getting on the plane with CGMs, or you hear beeping on the plane. You never, do you ever seek out diabetes in the air in the wild? Yeah, you know, I, I've yet to run into a, a a type one diabetic kid on my flight. I had one on my flight, but I intentionally put him there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, uh, I haven't heard. I haven't seen anybody with diabetes on my flights. I'm waiting for the day that that a young type one diabetic kid comes up and uh, is able to see the cockpit and and I see a CGM on on their arm and yeah. I'm able to to have a conversation with them. But I do uh, have a, a close connection with uh, so many parents within the type one diabetes community that you know have little ones that have diabetes. And, uh, it's been such an honor. But yeah, I, I, one of my favorite things about flying for the airlines is is taking families to their loved ones from point A to point B um, and getting them there safely. To, to answer your question, alerts and alarms, uh, we've got enough of them going on in the cockpit. Uh, we, we don't hear them in the cabin. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so. Major, thank you so much for sharing so much of your story. I cannot thank you enough for everything you've done for the entire community, and you continue to just pay it back and pay it forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stacy, for having me. This has been such an honor. It's been a long time coming. We've been trying to get this done, and I'm so happy to have had the chance to chat with you and, uh, and, your, and your listeners and uh Yes. Yeah, if, if any of you want to reach me, if you have any questions, um, if I could just leave my, my social media handle, it's fly type one with the number one. So F L Y T Y P E one. If you guys want to reach me on social media, uh, I will get back to you guys. It goes into my message request and I'll, I'll answer your questions um, that are sent my way. Um, but I do look forward to, to chatting with you again and I would be honored to be back on here. And if I am in Charlotte, I, I will, I will message you and we can uh, oh, hopefully grab lunch or something. That'd be great. I would love that. I will, I'll even go if you need to go through TSA, whatever you need. We'll, I'll have the rocking chairs in Charlotte, or we'll, if they allow you to leave the airport, oh, I'll take you someplace good. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be, that'd be fun. Thank you so much for having me. It was such an honor. Thanks. Talk to you soon. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Much more information at diabetes-connections.com, including the FAA page, he spoke about that, where you can get more information about what the requirements are. There's actually more than he explained there. Obviously, for time, he's not going to go through everything. I'll also link up some other news articles about Pietro 
And man, yeah, I hope to see him in the Charlotte airport. Wouldn't that be cool? I'm definitely going to be listening to the American flight announcements every time I'm on a plane now when they say who your captain is. (laughs) We're going to be stalking him. That was a longer than usual interview, but I think it was well worth it. So I will just wrap it up here by saying thank you, as always, to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. We do have a newscast this week, so I will see you back here very soon. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.